Good afternoon. My name is Ramesh Raina, and I am privileged to serve as chair of the biology department. On behalf of the College of Arts and Science in the department, I, I am pleased to welcome you to 2013 Yale and Dima Dow Christian Science Lecture. Today's lecture was made possible by generous endowment gift from Drs. Gelab and Dima Dow. Their gift helped create this lecture, which brings leading scientists and researchers and visionaries to Syracuse University annually for the purpose of engaging with students and faculty. In a real and wonderful way, it lifts the intellectual life of the department and it has lasting impacts on our students and faculty. It's a pleasure to recognize that we are joined today by Syracuse University Chancellor and President Nancy Cantor. Thank you for your support. I would also like to recognize and introduce Vice Chancellor and Provost uh, Eric Spina. Provost Spina is a mechanical and aerospace, aerospace engineer by training and joined Syracuse University faculty in 1988. Before his appointment as Provost, Spina served as Douglas D. Danforth Dean of Engineering and Computer Science at Syracuse University. It has, he has served in a range, wide range of leadership positions in addition to his teaching and administrative responsibility. And he has taken a leading role in developing Syracuse University and New York State's initiative leading to indoor environmental quality and environmental quality systems. Please join me welcoming Vice Chancellor and Spina. And fact of academic life that the more distinguished the speaker, the more introductions there are. So I think there's seven more until we get to our, our guest. Uh, thanks, Ramesh. It's re really a privilege to be here this afternoon. On behalf of the entire Syracuse University community, we welcome all of you, students, faculty, alumni, friends, and of course our distinguished guest, Dr. Peter Agre, for this special presentation. Uh, thanks to Ramesh and, and all of his folks who, uh, who organized uh, for uh, today's event, and a very special thank you. And please, please join me in, uh, in recognition to Drs. Galeb and Rima Dauk, whose extraordinary generosity, again, has made this lecture possible. <laughs> it's programs like this that exemplify our institutional belief in the power of collaborative engagement with commun communities of experts to deepen and, and enhance interdisciplinary scholarship and drive innovation in service of the great challenges of the day. Our featured guest, an extraordinarily accomplished scholar, Nobel Prize winning chemist, and global humanitarian, embodies the highest aspirations we hold for each and every one of our students to put their skills, talents, and scholarship to work in ways that make a positive difference in their communities and in the world. The challenges we face today, challenges relating to the environment, global health, peace and justice are vast and unprecedented in their complexity. To devise sustainable solutions demands intellectual excellence informed and shaped by multiple perspectives and realms of expertise, a collaborative mindset, a passion for making a difference, and it requires exemplary role models to motivate and inspire us along the way. Dr. Peter Agre is just such a role model, and we are both privileged and grateful for the opportunity to have him with us, to have him here with us today. I know you'll find his presentation thoroughly informative and deeply inspiring. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce George Langford, a nationally known cell biologist and neuroscientist and dean of SU's College of Arts and Sciences. Throughout his career, Dean Langford has maintained an interdisciplinary approach to teaching, research, service, and enterprise. Prior to joining SU, he served as Dean of the College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics at UMass Amherst. Before that, he was the Ernest Everett Just Professor of Natural Sciences and Professor of Biological Sciences at Dartmouth College. Please join me in welcoming Dean George Langford. George? Thank you very much, Provost Spina, and I want to add my thanks to Chancellor Cantor for joining us for this lecture today. This is a, a very special lecture. Allow me to thank all of you for coming out to be part of this lecture today. Uh, this is the second 
of the DELC Visiting Scientist Lectures. And we are very, very proud of the uh, opportunity to host this lecture and to have as our guest speaker, Dr. Peter Agre. But before I introduce our keynote speaker, I did want to just recognize again the two individuals who have made this lecture series possible, Drs. Galeb and Rina Dauk. Um, Galeb is a dear friend of the college. Um, he is a member of the college's Board of Visitors, um, and he co-chairs the Biology Department um, Advisory Board. Um, he is a graduate of our biology department, and he supports the college in so many different ways. Um, he graduated magna cum laude with a bachelor's degree here, and then went to, um, let's see, the American University of Beirut for his medical training. He got his MD there, and then he came back to the U.S. and got his business degree from the MIT Sloan School of Management. He's a pediatric nephrology consultant at the Children's Hospital in Boston and has a faculty appointment in pediatrics at the Harvard Medical School. So Galeb is very distinguished in his own right. And while a postdoc he, at MIT, he cloned the gene for the brain creatine kinase, the discovery of which led to the co-founding with his wife of a biotech company currently located in Palo Alto. So we really thank Galeb for his strong support of the college. Thank you, Galeb. <laughs> and Rima holds a PhD in biochemistry from the American University of Beirut and was a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins with Nobel Prize laureate Hamilton Smith. She is currently an associate professor at Duke University Medical School, where she holds several NIH grants to support her own research work. Reem is widely known for her work on energy metabolism um, and has pioneered the field of metabolomics. She holds more than 60 patents and has more than 50 scientific publications. In addition to co-founding the biotech company with her husband, she is the leading president of the, uh, the founding president, I should say, of the Metabolomics Society and co-founder of Metabolone Inc., which is a leading biotech company in metabolomics, which is located in the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. So again, we thank Rima for her strong support of the college. Thank you. So, Galeb and Reem, if you would join me at the podium, we have a small token of appreciation <laughs> to um, express our gratitude to you. So we thought you would love to have a framed copy of the poster of the speaker today. So on behalf of the college and the Department of Biology, for your strong support, we offer you this small token of appreciation. So, um, thanks again to all of you for joining us today, and I now um, call on, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Peter Agre. A Nobel laureate, I, I got to meet Peter just a few uh, minutes ago. We had a wonderful chat in my office. It's really a pleasure to have a chance to meet him and to share experiences and to hear what he has to say today. Dr. Agre is a university professor and director of the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute in the Bloomberg School of Public Health. He was awarded the 2003 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his discovery of aquaporins. These are a family of proteins that are found in cell membranes and are responsible for water channel, I mean for, for water transport. Um, he has also 
established that defects in aquaporins lead to a range of clinical disorders. Agre is deeply involved in many global issues, as was mentioned by Provost Spina. He um, has led or has continues to lead field research in Zambia and Zimbabwe. He uh, was the chair of the Human um, Rights Committee for the National Academies, and while he was chair, he led efforts on behalf of imprisoned scientists, engineers, and health professionals wor worldwide. He was past president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and while president, he led diplomatic visits and meetings with leaders of countries such as Cuba, North Korea, Myanmar, and Iran. Dr. Agre embodies the DAUC visiting scientist lecture principles, interdisciplinary thinking, creative scholarship, and engagement with the world. Please join me now in welcoming our keynote speaker today, Dr. Agre. Working? Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, George, for the gracious introduction. Survi, Ramesh, thank you for inviting me here. Narima, Michaela, thank you so much for sponsoring this event. It is, I think, a clear example of how philanthropy is the oxygen for academic science. It's been a thrill to be here. So this afternoon I'll be giving this public lecture about science opening doors worldwide, and tomorrow I'll be giving a technical scientific lecture about the water channels. In fact, this is, some of this is overlapping, but I'm going to concentrate today on sort of the Facebook of science, the people that I've met along the way that have made all the difference, and how this has led to op opening doors in countries that I would never have imagined as a young scientist I would ever, uh, ever travel to. This poll published by the Zogby firm nine years ago, one year after the invasion of Iraq, shows, I think, a very clear, a very clear demonstration that the United States is not necessarily well loved around the world. In five moderate Muslim countries, citizens were polled for their general impression of the United States. As you can see in the left-hand panel, very few responded favorably. Most were not undecided, they were unfavorable. But when these same citizens were polled for the impression of US science and technology, life sciences, medicine development, microelectronics, the responses were very different. And as you can see, the great majority had favorable impressions of the United States. I think a clear example that there's something about US government policy which is not well liked, but there's something about science and technology the kinds of things many of us spend our lives doing that are very much appreciated around the world. And I think with this in mind, I'm going to take you through a, a sort of a, a personal history of science, starting at the, the beginning. Here in the United States, we were an immigrant nation. We all came from somewhere. Our parents, our grandparents came from somewhere. If you were born outside of the United States, if your parents, one of them was born outside of the United States, raise your hand. Okay. That's, that's more than half. A clear example, we came from somewhere. My family came from Norway, where there were farmers and came to the United States, where the educational opportunities made a big difference. My dad went to the University of Minnesota, studied chemistry at Grant, Land Grant University, became a college professor, and was a strong inspiration to my brothers and me early in our lives that science, medicine, there's a special kind of career out there for us. One of the very interesting events, of course, was Dad as, as a scientific mentor as well as a father was some of the scientists that he knew personally, including Linus Pauling, with whom he served on the American Chemistry Society, American Chemical Society Education Community Committee. Paul, Pauling, of course, was a great chemist of the 20th century, but he didn't let his science end at the laboratory. He used his scientific presence to spearhead important worldwide events in terms of scientific understanding of the populace. 
he used every invitation to a scientific event to have a public lecture, maybe a lecture something like this, to talk about the dangers of thermonuclear war, including an invitation to the White House in 1962 where he joined 48 other Nobel laureates for dinner with President and Mrs. Kennedy. He led a protest around the White House in the afternoon, as you could see, holding a placard, Mr. Kennedy, we have no right to test. This was on the national news. This was no secret. And at 6 o'clock, he straightened his tie, put on his coat, stood in line, and met Pre President Kennedy at the front of the line in the reception. Kennedy, with a, with a wit, <laughs> smiled and said, Professor Pauling, I understand you've been around here earlier today. <laughs> By the end of the evening, Linus Pauling was da dancing with Jacqueline Kennedy. President Kennedy was dancing with Ava Helling Pauling. But an important transfer of information occurred. And this was the dangers of thermonuclear testing, which convinced Kennedy to sign the legislation approved by the United States Senate just weeks before his death, limiting the test ban of the, the testing of nuclear arms in the uh, environment. Something which during the Cold War was causing the release of huge amounts of nuclear uh, radioactivity in the atmosphere. A clear example as a youngster that actually scientists have a special role outside of their laboratories. So I, I got my start back in Minnesota and was tapped by Johns Hopkins to study medicine, which I was very keen to pursue because our Norwegian community back in Minnesota had a large emphasis on medical missionary work. Sam and I talked about that earlier today. They sent medical doctors, surgeons, nurses to the third world where they performed valuable clinical activities and started clinics, which went, went on for decades. So really my, my goal was to become a global health expert, and Hopkins having a strong presence in geographic medicine was a, a wonderful opportunity for me to get going in global health. And as a young person, I was able to join a laboratory uh, working on cholera, this horrible diarrheal disease which was sweeping through Southeast Asia and South Asia in the early 1970s. And the la laboratory was read, led by Pedro Cuatro Casas, the gentleman in the pink shirt, who was a, himself a refugee from Spain, fleeing Franco's regime, growing up in South America, and coming to the United States to do science, as so many of our friends and fa family members have done, they come to the United States to do science. And he, he had a really exciting group that he assembled, including to his, to your left, Gianfredo Puca, an interesting, perhaps unique character in science, Italian, handsome, as my wife can, considers him the handsomest man on the planet. <laughs> he was so handsome as a student, he was picked out by one of the famous Italian directors to play the role of a gigolo in a famous movie. <laughs> and yes, he was a champion downhill ski racer. And yes, his girlfriend was the heiress to the Vespa fortune, so he became a billionaire. <laughs> but his father was an academic neurologist who said, Jean Freder, you will become a scientist, you will become a doctor, you will become an academic. So someone with his background, what could he possibly be interested in studying in a laboratory? Remember, he's Italian. He decided he would solve the molecular basis of femininity. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. Do a Medline search, Puca, Sica, Nola, and Bresciani, Nature, 1970. Isolation of the estrogen receptor by affinity chromatography. It was a pretty stimulating place to be. And of course, when Jean Fredo was around back in the early 70s, smoking was allowed in the university. There was a constant stream of secretaries with unlit cigarettes walking by the lab so Jean Fredo <laughs> could be there. <laughs> now, the rest of the laboratory was a bit less photogenic. <laughs> my, my wife thinks we, we may have resembled the Manson gang. I'm not sure. <laughs> But shown here is an eccentric group of scientists who came to the United States from far to do science. There's a Polish snake collector, a French psychiatrist, who else is there? A Spanish anarchist. <laughs> it was an interesting group. And my job in the laboratory was to isolate the coli toxin similar to cholera toxin. And I have to tell you, if you're working on diarrheal diseases, it's not really a boon to your social life. <laughs> I remember attending a mixer at Goucher College, which at that time was a lady, ladies' college only, talking to a very attractive undergraduate woman who asked me a fateful question, Peter, what kind of medicine do you plan to specialize in? And I thought for a moment, should I tell her neurosurgery or radiology? <laughs> but I, I'm from Minnesota. I told her the truth. I said, I'm interested in diarrhea. <laughs> that, was, that was the end of that conversation. But 
anyway, we are who we are. One summer we were joined by a brilliant young man from American University of Beirut. Yes, Yarima Ishalab knew Naji, Naji Sahun. Naji was perhaps the most brilliant graduate of American University of Beirut, which is saying something, because this is a terrific university. But Naji came, he was a very shy person, very private. His father was Palestinian, his mother was Lebanese, and he shared with me things that I, I would not have guessed. It makes sense in retrospect. He grew up with the idea that as a Palestinian, that Israel is an enemy state. He was suspicious that the American Jewish community were all Zionists. And who should he work with in the laboratory but Marvin Ira Siegel, roly poly son of an Orthodox rabbi from Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> who assumed the same th thing in reverse, that Palestinians were untrustworthy, diabolical. And as you can see, they became the best of friends for the rest of their lives. There's something very special that happens in the laboratory, in addition to the technical information we're generating, the friendships which are lifelong. And it was about that time I met a younger version of this lady, this is my wife Mary, a few years later, who grew up on a farm and was not the least bit squeamish about my working on diarrheal diseases, <laughs> although she set some limits. Peter, if you're going to work on diarrheal diseases, pre please don't bring your work home at night. <laughs> Well, I'm tomorrow going to present the technical lecture of the water transport, but I'm going to show you today just the pictures of the people we met along the way that made so much difference. Water, of course, is the principal component of our bodies, the major component of each cell and each tissue of our bodies, and the same is true of all life forms. And water transport was first demonstrated by uh, an oocyte injection system. I'll talk about this tomorrow, but here we have a control oocyte. Here we have a test oocyte injected with complementary RNA, the putative water channel protein. It's exposed to an osmotic gradient. It explodes. Rapid osmosis, producing much jubilation in the laboratory. <laughs> and kind of for the first time drawing attention to our laboratory, a small laboratory, and bringing young people to our laboratory to study the water transport phenomenon. So I'll skip rapidly through this. We s worked on the structure of the protein, which we solved in collaboration with these two gentlemen. On the left is Yoshinori Fujiyoshi from Kyoto, Japan. On the right, Andreas Engel from the Biocentrum at the University of Basel. The first of a long series of international collaborations, which really allowed a small laboratory like ours to accomplish big things which we could never have done individually. I'll talk about the structure tomorrow. We worked on this physiology by collaborating with Soren Nielsen and his team from the University of Aarhus in Denmark, who pinpointed the location of the aquaporin-1 protein in the proximal nephron. And as you can see on this pile up, there are multiple different aquaporins from the human repertoire. There are 12. And if you consider all the aquaporins identified in other micro, microorganisms, plants, vertebrates, invertebrates, and even archaea, the genetics repository has more than 500 different aquaporin sequences. It's something nature has used extensively for water transport across tissues. We worked in the ocular aquaporin-1 with Masato Yasui from Keio University in Tokyo. He's back in Keio as the department chairman, Department of Pharmacology. We worked in the aquaporins in brain with our friends in Norway. And some pivotal experiments were undertaken by this young man, Mahmoud Amiri Mahadem. Now, Stuart, most people here are not Norwegians. They, they may not know this, but that's not a typical Norwegian name. <laughs> Maybe Mahmoud Mahmoudsen would be. <laughs> it would interest you to know that Mahmoud started his scientific career as a refugee from the Islamic Republic of Iran, fleeing for his life, growing up in a refugee camp in Pakistan, where he was adopted by the Norwegian Social Services, given an opportunity to study science. He's now a leading European neuroscientist. It has worked out the role of aquaporins during brain edema. Again, I'll talk about this tomorrow. And this young lady <laughs> happens to be, <laughs> she's holding, she looks the same. <laughs> Surabhi. 20 years ago, a young scientist from India contacted me, asked for an appointment to chat about being a postdoc in the laboratory. Surabhi Raya. Ramesh and Surabhi came to the Johns Hopkins as postdoctoral fellows and they changed our world at Hopkins, and they continue to change it here in Syracuse. So the work that Surabhi 
accomplished with the cloning and expression of aquaporin-5 is explain how water transport occurs in salivary glands, lacrimal glands, sweat glands, and the pulmonary secretory organisms. Her paper, which I've shown here, has been cited more than 300 times. I would say that was a good investment of effort, Sorby. Thanks so much. And you still look gorgeous. <laughs> So there's an aquaglycerporin family, again I'll talk about this tomorrow. Permeation of water and glycerol is important in the skin where the basal levels of skin are heavily, they have a heavy expression of the aquaporin, aquaglycerporin-3, which the beauty industry has seized. Now I have no financial ties to the Christian New York company. <laughs> there's some days I'd love to have financial ties. <laughs> It was three years ago, or maybe it was four years ago, some executives from Christian Dior came to visit me to invite me to give a lecture in Paris. And I was a little bit suspicious. What do I know that Christian Dior is interested in? And the answer is they have a, they have a commercial product they'd like you to buy, Hydraction Skin Cream. It's, it's exorbitantly expensive. It costs about 50 euros for a 50-gram jar. Their chemists have identified some small naturally occurring molecules that lead to subtle expression increases of the aquaglycerporin-3 in sun-exposed skin. Now, in no way is this proof of principle that if you, if you look at this ad, you think if you use enough of the skin cream, you'd look like this. And <laughs> I'm not personally convinced, but <laughs> it shows, I think, the extent that science goes far beyond what you expected in your own laboratory. And those of you who speak French <coughs> will see the, uh, this is the back cover of the Marie Claire Beauty magazine. Uh, profound hydration, spectacular results, and what's this, the Nobel Prize in chemistry. <laughs> I, I, I showed this to my mother back in Minnesota. M mother's a farm girl. She, she never went to college. Very wise, though, in terms of common sense. I showed this to her, and she smiled and said, Peter, I think you're finally doing something useful. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Aquaporin 7 and 9 in fat and liver, release of glycerol for the manufacture of glucose during fasting and starvation, and turns out to be permeated freely by arsenite, a defense mechanism important in the defense against arsenic toxic, uh, toxicity. In parts of the world, notably eastern India and Bangladesh, where the surface waters are contaminated with cholera, The groundwaters are tapped through these tube wells, but with limited resources, they've been un unable to do the testing everywhere. But it turns out many of these are heavily, heavily poisoned with naturally occurring arsenic deposits. An epidemic of hepatocellular carcinoma is emerging. Of course, the information that we have a defense mechanism is, is interesting, but the prevention of this is, of course, the provision of pure drinking water. Again, science crossing borders, taking us into areas we would never have gone. And plants. Plants have aquaporins. I think 35 different aquaporin genes in the Arabidopsis genome, 50 in the rice genome, responsible for many adaptations plants accomplish to survive drought and other stresses. So this, this is a picture of our laboratory in the morning. I got the call from Stockholm. You can imagine at 5.30 in the morning, the phone rings and a pleasant Swedish voice on the other end. This is an important telephone call from Sweden for Professor Peter Audrey. Are you Professor Audrey? I thought I knew who it was. I said, I sure am. And they explained I'd share the Nobel Prize in Chemistry with Roderick McKinnon, a structural biologist studying potassium channels at Rockefeller University. So we had a short conversation. They notified me that they would have a press conference in Stockholm in 10 minutes. I should get ready for my day. So I sprinted for the shower, and my wife, Mary, called my mother back in Minnesota, informed her that I would share the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. My mother thought for a moment. My father, who was a chemistry professor, had, had died eight years earlier. And I guess she was thinking of him. She said, Mary, tell Peter that's very nice, but don't let this go to his head. Because <laughs> it surely would have gone to my dad's head. He was quite an enthusiast. I think, I think the idea is not that she meant to diminish the importance of the prize, but you still have to do something useful. This usefulness is something that's always in front of us. And so it was this, that and, and let's see here. 
things, of course, in a celebration like this get a little out of hand. <laughs> you, you don't control the, the levels of celebrity or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this is. And I'd just like to point out to the young people here that the implication that I'm the Wells Liquor Store's best customer <laughs> is a vicious exaggeration. <laughs> so here we are on the stage at the Nobel festivity, and there, there are two prizes here, of course, the Nobel Medal, which really is important not so much for who gets it, because I could quiz you quick who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2002, 2004. We don't remember. But I think the importance is that when these announcements are made, the world is awakened in the morning with the notion that science is changing life as we know it. And so it's really a, our best PR mechanism. The, the other prize here is, is the people standing around me, my wife and our kids who supported me through all the science. And we each have that, whether we're students, postdocs, junior faculty, or senior faculty. We have a support team, and it's important to recognize that and thank them for that support. It also gave me an opportunity to do something which I'd always intended to do, and that was move into the malaria field. Our laboratory had been studying malaria for just a few years, and we've gotten into this in a big way because malaria continues to be a huge problem worldwide. In sub-Saharan Africa in particular, it's a, it's a major cause of, of, of death of children five and under. This year, approximately one-half billion that's billion with a B. One half billion people will develop malaria. And somewhere in the range of 600 to 800,000 children will die of malaria. So it's a huge scourge. It's getting better in some areas, but it's getting worse in other areas. And is there a chance that we could do something as scientists to help this effort? So we went into a new direction, and I took the, the directorship of a malaria research institute and have concentrated our effort in sub-Saharan Africa where the burden of the disease is most severe. And from a laboratory standpoint, we're studying the aquaglycerin movements into red cells, which turns out to be very important during the development of the malaria parasite into multiple daughter parasites. So here is a single cell malaria parasite invading a red cell. And here it is after it's divided into 32 daughter cells. So when these chizons, as they're called, break and release the daughter cells, then we have an amplification of the, of the infection. So with each cycle, 32 times 32, that's 1,000, times 32 times 32 is a million. So after six cycles, there are a billion parasites. I mean, it goes up rapidly, leading to horrific fevers and to severe toxicity. The medicines that we have now are pretty, pretty good, but there's evidence of growing drug resistance. Moreover, our methods of diagnosis are far from precise. There's much that could be done in a laboratory to help with this effort. And the victims, of course, are these kids, these small children, innocent children, who really want to have a happy and normal life, not looking for riches in terms of Western levels of, of finances, but an opportunity to have a normal life. Of course, it's impossible for little kids like this when they're stricken with malaria. Because while many will die, others recover but never fully recover. Shown here is a youngster brought into the Mission Hospital adjacent to our field station in southern Zambia. His life was saved. He was brought in a coma. And the physician, shown on the far right, Philip Tuma, rescued him from near death, but the child has survived but not recovered his, his vision. The upward gaze is due to cerebral cortex damage, or the, vis the visual cortex. He will never see again. So you can imagine what a handicap that would be anywhere, but in the third world to be epileptic, learning impaired, blind or deaf is even worse. So shown here is the logo for our research institute, the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute, and we were working in collaboration in southern Zambia with the Macha Institute, the M Malaria Institute at, at Macha, a village in southern Zambia. And I'm shown here with our research team. Here's Phil Tuma, a physician, a uh, Johns Hopkins trained pediatrician from Pennsylvania who's devoted his whole life to working in rural Africa. And shown here is Sungana Marakura, our chief sci scientist of the research station in southern Zambia. Sungana is actually Zimbabwean. He's an Oxford educated postdoc at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. His dream is to return to Zimbabwe to work on malaria, to help his people. And the work has been investigation. We're not aid agents. 
We don't have the resources to do that, but the epidemiological surveillance in southern Zambia has had a very positive outcome by out rapidly diagnosing and aggressively treating the children with malaria. We've been able to knock down the prevalence of the disease by 98% in a decade. For decades and decades, there were about 1,000 to 2,000 cases every year with in the range of 50 to 100 deaths. The aggressive treatment, diagnosis, and surveillance was able to reduce this dramatically in just a couple of years. The year when there was a stock outage and the medicines were unavailable, there was a resurgence. But it declined again with the return of the med medicines and the introduction of the insecticide-treated bed nets has taken it down to about 2% of what it was. But it's not 0%. We know what will happen if we stop our efforts. It'll come right back. So there's still much work to be done. But it is a tractable disease, a 19th century disease, which is still out of control in the 21st century. And the places where these children live are not necessarily adjacent to the field hospitals. They're most live in remote villages, and much of sub-Saharan Africa is not connected by highways or roads or even trails, but little dirt tracks such as this, which looks pretty easy to manage. But this is the beginning of the rainy season. At the end of the rainy season, the grasses will be two meters tall. These are inaccessible places, and that's where the disease burden exists. And so our surveillance team is able to visit these remote domiciles, do active surveillance, looking for parasites, it's easy to diagnose children when they're sick with malaria, but it's hard to diagnose malaria in individuals who have had it repeatedly, older individuals who have developed an immune tolerance, so they carry low levels of the parasite, but when the rains return and the mosquitoes return, they're the source of the resurgence of the epidemic. And they're, they're, they're the poorest of the poor. They, we read about the two billion people on Earth who live on less than $2 a day. These, these are some of those people. But they're very religious, they're very devoted, they work their hearts out. But when someone gets sick, or a child gets sick with malaria, the whole system crashes. And they have very religious names. I remember one morning we met Benjamin, Lazarus, Shadrach, Meshach. We never met in the Bendigo, but <laughs> he's out there somewhere. And in their own way, they're very grateful for this. Yet they're using implementation to farm the countryside implementation that was discarded in this country 150 years ago to just make ends meet. And everybody works. The kids work. They carry the grain to the villages to be milled. The older children take care of the younger children. But it's not like they don't know how to have fun. I mean, kids are kids. If they're healthy, if they're well-fed, if they're loved, they will have fun. And it, it's really a glorious experience to be able to work with them. This notion that the third world <coughs> doesn't value life like we do in the United States is completely inconsistent with my experience. They revere children. The resources are saved for the children. They do everything they can for the future. They really love their children. This little girl, upside down is her school book. You look closely, it says, school is cool. <laughs> No, the transmission of malaria is not just <coughs> random direct contact, but through a vector, the Anopheles mosquito. And it's a complex life cycle. The Anopheles carry the parasite and cross borders. And this is, this is the problem. We're working in both Zimbabwe and Zambia. Zambia, on the near side of the colonial bridge at Victoria Falls, has a good liberal democracy. And in most of Zambia, good things are happening with provision of public health. Up on the border of Congo, it's very difficult. In Zimbabwe, things are quite different. These were the same country once. They were the colony of Rhodesia. Northern Rhodesia became Zambia. Southern Rhodesia became Zimbabwe. And of course, the problems in Zimbabwe are compounded by a vicious, cruel regime now in its 31st, 35th year of leadership, a collapse of the economy and, and the their election of duty has led to a disappearance of the public health infrastructure. And guess what? Malaria has come back. Zim had negligible malaria 20 years ago and is heavily infested now. So our sites of work are here in southern Africa, here's Zambia, here's Zimbabwe, here's South Africa. There's three sites. The Matcha Hospital, which I've talked about here, 
I won't be talking about the work up on Congo where there's enormous malaria burden, but I'll show you some pictures of eastern Zimbabwe, one of the richest parts of Africa, a place where we should be able to make good progress. Shown here is a tea estate in eastern Zimbabwe. I mean, it's a gorgeous country. And it's a potentially rich country with wonderful people and educated populace. Well, how is it that malaria has gotten out of control? And the clinics are still there, in many places staffed by very diligent nurses, nurse clinicians, who work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And we're asking one of these nurses how long she's been on duty, she said, since 1994. <laughs> it's not a shortage of trained and dedicated public health. It's a provision of infrastructure and new medicines. This is the Honda Valley where these pictures are taken now has more than 100% malaria prevalence every year. Everybody gets it at least once. And every morning the clinics are jammed with children brought in by their mothers with malarial fevers. I love this older man. He's on his way back from church, very religious, very dedicated. He wants a better life for his children and his grandchildren. And in Zimbabwe, they have also very interesting names. Many of the men are named names like love more, give more, pray more. I met a waiter at a hotel in Eastern Zim. His name tag said never. I asked, is that your name, never? He said, well, it's a shortened form. My real name is never more. <laughs> I said, there must be a story. How could you be named never more? He said, well, I'm the youngest of nine children. My mother named me never more. <laughs> well, there's a real humanity here. You, and again, they're, they're very religious, they're very devoted to the well-being of their children. But a lot of the religious groups have great suspicion of medical care. They choose not to have their children treated. So there's a cultural barrier as well as a scientific barrier and an infrastructure barrier. But these are barriers that could be, could be overcome. And here's Singano in front of the National Institutes of Health in Harare. Uh, an, exist, uh, an institution is still existing, but with, without infrastructure. So we're, we're trying to work with them, but it, it's been a challenge. So I'm going to talk now about some of the other doors that science has opened <coughs> for me. And these involve trips to other countries where our government and their governments are not on good terms. And I've made, as president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, trips to quite a number of countries. I, I won't be talking about our, our trips to Myanmar or Tunisia, Lebanon or, or Iran. Bruce Alberts and I are due to return to Iran after the elections, probably in July. But I'll talk to you a little bit about our trips to Cuba and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, to challenging situations where science has opened doors that are not possibly open for our political leaders. So since the Obama administration has been in office, there's been a liberalization of the interpretation of the guidelines, the same guidelines at present, restricting U.S. travel to Cuba. Basically, an embargo has been in place since 1960, preventing interchange between our countries because our government thinks they will collapse and surrender. It hasn't happened. And of course, in Cuba, probably some of you have been to Cuba. Some of the students have been to Cuba. Raise your hand. There's one. Not others well, shy. I'm sure others have been there. It's a really interesting country. And visiting Cuba is a little bit like returning to the past. Of course, the revolution is still kept alive in front of the people there. And then the places where the old cars are preserved are still very, very interesting to look at. The basic car on the street of Havana is a wreck, trust me. The embargo has had a devastating effect on the people of Cuba. And the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 has led to a 75% decline in the personal wealth of the Cuban citizens. But they're, they're not giving up. They're, they're very proud of their independence and proud of what they've accomplished. They're ready for tourists to come. I actually didn't smoke that thing. And I, I have no idea who this woman was. <laughs> she wanted $5 for having her picture taken with me. I thought, my wife hates this picture. <laughs> Where there has been investment, and there's been considerable investment in parts uh, of the EU, the old colonial architecture is lovely. I mean, old Havana is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But where there has not been investment, the architecture is crumbling. 
it's clearly a state that's ready for a transition. But what direction and when will it happen? And how can we catalyze relations between our countries? So I've, I've led a series of scientific visits to Cuba, first meeting with the, the leaders of Cuban science, the old bulls of Cuban science. These are all people my age or older. Shown here on the far left is the director of the Cuban Biotechnology Institute. On the far right, the director of the Kinley Vaccine Institute. And they focus their research activities to pr on prevention of disease. They realize as a poor country, they can't do modern molecular science for basic scientific goals. They're looking to improve the well-being of the average Cuban. And in part, this is the dream of Fidel Castro. One of his aims of the revolution was to make healthcare universal in Cuba, something we still haven't achieved in this country. His son, Fidel Castro Diaz Balart, is a physicist who I became friends with. And he invited me to spend an evening with his father. You can imagine it was a pretty interesting evening. I, I say we had a conversation, but it went like this. He harangued me for two hours. I took a bathroom break, and he harangued me some more. <laughs> he had a lot to say about the Cuban Missile Crisis, about the Bay of Pigs invasion, and about the health care in Cuba, which was one of his major dreams for the revolution. Cuba, of course, exports more medical doctors than any country in the world. Now, these may not be Mayo Clinic level doctors, but they're providing health care, and it's a number one priority because at the time of the revolution, health care was unavailable to poor Cubans. No one saw a patient in Cuba without money. And Castro, while his father was a wealthy landowner, he was, his mother was the maid. He was an illegitimate child. So he grew up in the villa and in the village and was aware of the needs of the, of the poor people. It was a pretty interesting evening, I have to say, and in the end, there's, there's a spark of humanity here. The, the old guard is ready to transition. They're not going to collapse and go away, but an orderly transfer of power will occur in Cuba. And I think the scientific inroads are a good way to go in a positive direction. So I had the opportunity to lecture at the University of Havana, and what I experienced was astonishing. The young students sworn the podium afterwards because they were so grateful to have an American scientist come talk about Cuba. I mean, these are all young people in their late teens, early 20s, born long after the revolution. They're not diehard communists. They're young scientists, just like the young scientists here at Syracuse University. They want a chance to do science. And I think that's something that is within reach. So I'm going to end by talking about our trips to North Korea, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And my involvement in North Korea started with contact from this young man here, my friend Stuart Thorsen from our Norwegian community back in Minnesota. You can always tell the Norwegians at a special event, they wear their best ski jackets. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart contacted me while I was president of the AAAS, asking me about my in interest in participating in putative trips to North Korea. And we worked together, in fact, made our first trip to North Korea. It was December of 2009. Has anybody been to North Korea? No hands. Very rarely do I meet someone who's been to North Korea because it's, it's the hermit nation. It's very difficult to get there. The invitations are difficult to get. And what you see is, is pretty interesting. So shown here is our scientific delegation and they're members of uh, the Center for CRDF. Civilian Research Development Foundation in Washington, D.C., which was the secretariat of the organization. Stewart, as the principal in the Maxwell School, collaboration with Kim Shek University. That picture of us is in front of Kim Shek University in Pyongyang. The first and longest standing collaboration between a U.S. university and a North Korean university, as well as members of the Korea Society and the American Association for Advancement of Science. So, so we're outside one of the State Academy of Science laboratories in Pyongyang. The Pyongyang itself resembles the twilight zone. <laughs> it looks real, but there's something that's not quite real. Maybe surreal is the adjective. It's dark at night. There's minimal electrical infrastructure. And even Monday, in the middle of the day, you'll see very few people in the downtown areas. And Pyongyang is pretty tidy. It's, it's, it's meant to impress international visitors. The real Koreans are in the countryside, leading very, very difficult lives. North Korea does not generate enough food to 
feed its population, and the top priority is feed the army. So it's a difficult situation. The leadership, Kim Jong Il, so on the left, Kim Il Sung on the right, are the grandfather and father of the current leader, Kim Jong Un. And their pictures are everywhere. There's a, a, a mythical deification of these individuals as being visionary leaders of North Korea. In fact, it's a cruel police state. But it is what it is. The chance as a scientist to meet North Koreans, to register some humanity, to engage in scientific discussions was a, our objective. And I, I feel we succeeded. The North Koreans have this sense of self-reliance, juche, go it alone. But they can't achieve juche because they're reliant on Western food importation. At the same time, they'll do something stupid. I mean, right now we're seeing a manifestation of the belligerent, bellicose leadership. It's very difficult. And the people of North Korea are constantly encouraged to work hard for the countrymen, the great glorification of the Democratic People's Republic. But the scientists in North Korea are like we are, men and women, looking to make the world a better place for their children and their grandchildren. And on this display at the, at the Great Reading Hall is nothing but science magazine, well-thumbed, a great appreciation for American science, a common, a common interest that we can discuss peacefully. And the North Korean scientists, as I said, are really wonderful people. They tend to be the ones we met, members of the party. You can recognize that because of the Kim Il-sung lapel pin. But this was not an occasion where we discussed ideology. We talked about science, biotechnology, plant biotechnology, the, the idea being that they could create, create better sources of food, agricultural crops. Now, there's an interesting opportunity that has emerged in North Korea that you should know about, and that is the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology. This is the only non-governmental university in North Korea. It's English language education for the top Korean scientists and engineers. And this university was, again, the gift, uh, an example of philanthropy, the gift <coughs> of James Kim, a Korean-born businessman who lives in Florida, who's leaving his entire estate to this English language university in North Korea with the hope that this will bring the countries closer together. Now, the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology is nobody's idea of a party school. You're a student. I think Stuart took this picture, did you? Probably. They marched to school in step, singing patriotic songs, and death to the devils of the United States, and things of that sort. It's very, very tightly organized. The students attend lecture, and you'll notice the students are only men, all in dark suits. They sat in attendance when I gave my lecture. When I started my lecture, there was my best joke. They understood it, but nobody laughed. <laughs> then I explained, that was a joke, that was funny. Then they burst into laughter. <laughs> they're aware that they're being observed. Here are two students being interviewed by, by the North Korean press, but look over the shoulder. University officials are observing, always observing. The intelligence officers are watching. But there's a humanity there, and I think we can't expect things to happen overnight. Is it worth pursuing? And I, I think it is. So I'm shown here with Ryong Gi, let me get the name right, Run Gi Hong. Got that right. He is the director of the International Division of the State Academy of Sciences of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. He was our host. And after a week together, we got to know him pretty well. I remember driving in the van with Dr. Hong underneath the magnificent gate outside of Pyongyang, something like the Brandenburg Gate, called the Reunification Gate. I asked Dr. Hung, because he traveled to he traveled to South America, North America, Europe, I asked him, have you ever been to the Republic of Korea, South Korea, just a hundred miles down the road, so close? Dr. Hung thought for a moment and he answered very slowly with sadness in his voice. He said, no, Peter. It is not possible. It is still not possible. So near, but still so far. In the last morning of our first visit, we were sharing breakfast. And Dr. Hung told me about his 
grandson, a six-year-old boy, living with him and his, his wife. And he explained that his grandson became very alarmed when he heard grandfather would spend a week in a hotel in Pyongyang with Americans. Because the small children, of course, are brainwashed into thinking that Americans are devils, untrustworthy, violent. So when he heard that his grandfather would be spending a week with Americans, the little boy said, Grandfather, bring the rifle. <laughs> Dr. Hong thought that was pretty amusing. I, I didn't know what to think of it. But I had a box of unopened granola bars. So I gave him, I said, why don't you give these to your grandson? Never thought more about it. A year and a half later, the State Academy of Science Leadership was invited to the United States. The State Department approved that they could visit with us at the Carter Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And President Carter is respected in North Korea. So this was an opportunity. And it started with a serious dialogue, a long, narrow table. I was at the center of the American side of the table, Dr. Hung on the other side. And the meeting started with a, a harangue where he issued complaints that potential collaborations have not been fulfilled. There's been no resource transfer. My leadership thinks this is a waste of time. And it was my chance to respond. As you can imagine, I was a bit tongue-tied, so I, I said the first thing that came to mind. I said, Dr. Hung, how's your grandson? And I could see a little smile on his face. He said, well, he's fine. He said, did he tell you to bring the rifle? And he, he cracked up. He said, no, he said, bring back some candy. <laughs> Maybe that's what this notion of science diplomacy is about, the personal bonding between a scientist from the United States and a scientist from North Korea, the grandson. Maybe these friendships have a tenure that'll bring us closer together. I, I don't know. But I think it's pretty fair to say we have nothing to lose. Our scientific discussions were all life sciences. They had nothing to do with engineering and weapons development. It was all about peaceful scientific collaboration. So in, in closing, I'd like to share a, a, a little wisdom that I, I picked up from one of my young scientists in the laboratory, Connie Lu from China. Those of you who speak Chinese or read Chinese will know that the character for crisis in Mandarin is actually two characters, Wei Ji, Wei, a time of danger, Ji, a time of opportunity. And isn't that really appropriate for the lesson at hand? The dangers in terms of world, weapons development, conflict, diseases, starvation, crop failure, devastating and serious. But also the science provides an opportunity, Weiji. And in Korean, the symbol is very similar. They pronounce it Weiji. And I think when you look back in your career, as I do now, I'm, I'm 64, think about all the challenges faced, sometimes I have to admit that the personal connections, the opening of doors worldwide is maybe the most fun part and the most rewarding part of it all. So with that, let me, let me thank you again for coming to my lecture, Ramesh, Ruby, for the invitation, Rima, Kaleb. It's really good to be here. I guess if there's time for some questions, I'll do my best. And if anybody's interested in the technical side of water channels, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Thanks so much. There's a reception, and that's even better. <laughs> <laughs> Th thank you again.